Hello, welcome to AE3530, System Dynamics and Vibrations. In this video, we are going to go through an introduction for this course. First, we're going to just describe what is system dynamics and what is vibrations. And then we'll go through a, a classification of dynamic systems. So system dynamics is the synthesis of mathematical models to represent dynamic responses of physical systems for the purpose of analysis, design, and or control. So we'll write this here. This is the synthesis of mathematical models mathematical models to represent dynamic responses of physical systems for the purpose for the purpose of analysis, design, and or control. Okay, so then vibrations then is the study of flexible motion in systems due to internal restoring forces and externally applied forces. So vibrations is the study of flexible motion in systems due to internal restoring forces internal restoring forces and externally applied forces. Uh, and so internal restoring forces here means things like that are in inherent to the system that will show up regardless of what excitation is applied to the system. Things like springs produce internal forces. Uh, there's an inertial internal force, mass times acceleration. At least you can consider it to be an internal inertial force. Damping as well, or friction, it results in internal restoring forces. Whereas something like hitting a structure with a hammer and then letting it vibrate, that hammer hit would be considered external to the system. That's something that isn't inherent or doesn't belong structurally or physically to the system. That is something that is external to it and then applied. So in this course, we're going to focus on vibrations for the first half. And then we're going to focus on system dynamics for the, first, for the second half. And the reason for that is that uh, a lot of the things that you will we'll deal with in system dynamics uh, will build upon what we've done in vibrations. Uh, and is really kind of the next step, in my opinion, up from vibrations. Now, some other instructors will teach these to intertwine, where they'll switch between vibrations and uh, system dynamics topics and then mix them all up. Uh, that, in my opinion, results in a jumping around in topics and, in, in my opinion, is, leads to, uh, is not the most effective way to teach. That's my opinion. Not, there's no, I don't have any evidence. This is my opinion. And as a result, this class, like I said, it's the first time I'm teaching this particular class, that, you know, this approach is somewhat of an experiment in, that, in how it works. My opinion is that doing vibrations first and then doing system dynamics will lead to a, a stronger understanding of both of them rather than jumping around in topics. That's my opinion. Okay, we're going to now talk about the classification of dynamic systems. So first we are going to distinguish between what are called distributed systems or continuous systems and lumped systems. So for a distributed system, we're going to consider something like a string 
Let me redraw that. A string that is oscillating. Oops. There. Some string that is oscillating. We'll give it a displacement y of t, first of all. But also, we're going to add in here a coordinate in the x direction. And we'll say that this is a function of x and t. So it's a function of space and time. So distributed systems are continuous with respect to both time and at least one spatial variable. So something like a string or a beam are continuous with respect to time and with respect to a single spatial dimension. If we think about something like a plate or a, a wing, for example, these can be considered to be continuous with respect to uh, two spatial variables, um, a plate or a membrane, let's say. Uh, Something like an airplane is now going to be continuous with respect to three, all three spatial dimensions. These require an infinite number of internal variables, meaning that because we are continuous with respect to space, we now have an infinite number of internal restoring forces or internal variables, we could say. At every point in, the, in this string, there is some tension acting, pulling it together. And you can define that continuously throughout the entire string. These systems are governed by partial differential equations, uh, or PDEs, such as the wave equation, beam equation, plate equations, and so forth. Um, and like I mentioned, some examples here are first the strings, play beams, let's say. These are both 1D plates. And then, of course, any kind of solid full 3D object. These are in 1D, and this is a 2D system. Okay, in contrast, lumped systems are only continuous with respect to time. So we'll draw a bunch of discrete masses, and in this case, let's just connect them with some type of wire. This wire would have a tension in each of these. For each wire would have their own tension. And we would describe their displacements discreetly. So we would have, let's say, yi of t. And in this case, of course, this is just the second mass. Uh, but the point is, is that you're going to have a discrete number of them. And that in, at each mass, you're going to have a discrete tension. So you would have, uh, or a discrete internal force, let's say. Like I mentioned, these are continuous with respect to time only. There is a finite number of internal variables or discrete number, an integer number you could say as well. These are governed by ordinary differential equations. And so examples of these systems include spring mass systems, which are our fundamental vibrating systems, spring mass systems. The second is pendulums. That's an example of a, a discrete or a lumped real world system. And then also rigid bodies are considered to be lumped. So a primary difference between a distributed system and a lump system when you're considering something like a rod, if you make it rigid, that means you're assuming that there's no deformation in the body, that that rod is never going to deform in any way, and then it becomes a lump system represented by a mass and a moment of inertia that are spatially independent. If you consider flexible motion or deformation in that rod or you allow that, then it's no longer a rigid body and it now becomes a distributed system where the, the mass is described by a mass distribution per length typically for a rod. Uh, and then there really isn't a description of what that moment of inertia is. Well, it depends on what you're studying and how you derive that. And it depends on the equations. Uh, as a result, you end up with a partial differential equation, whereas in the lumped case, you would end up with at least two equations of motion, one for the angular motion, one for uh, translational motion in a, in a 2D system, at least. Okay, we can also talk about continuous time systems and discrete time systems.
Uh, and also let me add here, we're primarily going to focus on lumped systems in this class, though we will do some work on the string equation and vibrations of strings. Uh, and in that case, we will be looking at a distributed system, but we're going to primarily focus uh, on these lump systems. We'll just add a little note here that our primary focus will be on lumped systems. Okay, systems can also be continuous in time or discrete in time. So a continuous time system means that its functions and the variables are, are defined for all time. And this is similar to a, 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 an analog signal in the sense that analog signals are continuous in time, meaning that at any point in time you can get a measurement from that signal. And, and these are governed by differential equations. Um, and so an example of this would be the instantaneous population, meaning the population at every instant in time. Discrete time systems are, have functions and variables that are defined at only discrete times. We're talking about ti, ti plus 1, and so on. And this is not a system that, we're not thinking about systems that have been sampled here. You know, continuous in time signal that's been sampled. That still comes from a time, a continuous time system. We're t in this case, we're thinking about systems that only have outputs at these discrete times. And this is similar to a digital signal in a way, uh, but digital symbol signals are discrete in both time and in amplitude as well. So the discrete time systems are a little bit different. They can be continuous in, in amplitude, but they're always discrete. They're discrete in time by definition. These are going to be governed by either a set of difference equations or what are called dynamic maps. Uh, and in this case, a dynamic map is something where you have x i plus 1, so x at the next iteration is equal to some function uh, of f of x i at the previous iteration. And this could depend on multiple previous iterations, but in general, we're looking at just being dependent on the, the previous iteration. An example of this would be the average yearly population. So what is the average population over a single year? In that case, this is discrete in time because there's a single number for each year. Whereas for the instantaneous population, you could still express that as a function of years, but then you would have fractions of a year represented. You would have the population at half a year, one third of a year, uh, nine seventeenths of a year, whatever you want. Uh, whereas with the average yearly population, you only have a single number for each year, and you cannot have a number at a fraction of a year, because that is not defined. In this class, we're going to focus on continuous time systems. And we may, we may encounter discrete time systems. Uh, but unlikely that if we do, it would be reserved for the end of uh, the semester. Okay, there are also time varying and time invariant systems. Time variant systems are those that have system parameters that just vary with time, uh, meaning that their exact parameters are actually varying with time. So an example of this is a, a rocket undergoing launch. So when a rocket is, is, well, first, you know, sits on the ground starting, it has a, a fixed mass. As it, once it launches and, you know, starts to go through launching, it is expending fuel extremely rapidly, meaning that its mass is changing as a function of time. That mass is changing very rapidly, and that therefore means that the mass becomes a time varying parameter. Time invariant systems are those where the parameters remain constant. And in this case, you can think of like a bicycle. The mass of a bicycle is not going to change over time, over, well, it will change over time, 
as you pick up dirt and grime as things wear down. But the time scale for that is on the order of months to years. Whereas the rocket time scale, the change of mass, is on the order of seconds. So in that sense, you can consider the, the bicycle to have fixed parameters and maybe every couple years you update those parameters or every year or so you need to update them if you really care that much. Uh, but in general, those parameters are going to be fixed. Now, something like an airplane, which uses fuel as it flies from one location to another, this is something that can be modeled as time invariant. And what you would want to do if you're concerned with behavior at different fuel percentages or different masses is that you would consider different regimes and you would alter the mass for each of those regimes and then you would set the mass as a fixed quantity in those regimes. So we can say that this is time invariant. The mass does change, but it changes on a much longer time scale than the vibrations of the plane, for example, or the control, the motion of a control surface, or the flow of the air over the wings and the body. Those, those behaviors and phenomena occur on a much smaller time scale than the change in the mass of the airplane. This is also true for something like a car as well. You can consider that to have, cons uh, to have mass that is constant. Now, I just want to make a note here that a rocket can be modeled using a higher dimensional time invariant system by adding an equation for the changing mass. So you would introduce an additional equation, whether that is a algebraic equation or a differential equation, to model the change in mass over time. Uh, most likely, you'd be using a differential equation. So an ex example of this from our, my research uh, focuses on how bolts loosen in structures. We consider the tension in the bolt or the preload to be a, a, a degree of freedom or a variable that we want to track, an internal variable. And we consider that the dynamic properties, the stiffness, the damping, et cetera, of the, the bolt to joint, they change as a function of the tension. And as the bolt loosens, it loosens over time, this then makes those parameters time varying. And what we do is we introduce a, a differential equation that governs the tension in the bolt and how it changes over time. And as a result, we end up with tension-dependent stiffness and damping for the joint parameters. And we avoid having time-dependent parameters. By doing this, we've had to increase the dimensionality of our problem. For example, we go from having, uh, if we just think of the simplest case of two oscillators that are coupled by a bolted joint, we go from having two second order differential equations to now having two second order ODEs plus a first order ODE. So we go from having two equations to three equations into a five dimensional state space. Okay. We can also talk about uh, linear systems versus nonlinear systems. In linear systems, all of the variables are well just linear in the system equations that means that like the stiffness is independent of the displacement the damping is independent of the velocity mass is independent of the acceleration or uh, the damping is independent of the velocity and the displacement any of those there's no non-linearity involved at all uh, something like k times x cubed for the force of a spring that would be considered non-linear k times x is a linear uh, spring all parameters are then independent of the system variables and superposition holds. Uh, and superposition means that we can consider the response for different excitations separately and then we can solve our equations for that and then combine them together, both in terms of vibrations as well as in system dynamics. In a nonlinear system, well, nonlinear terms appear in the system variables. Again, this is like having a spring that has a that is dependent on the displacement cube. So you would have k times x cubed rather than k times x. That would be a nonlinear spring. Uh, and again, the parameters are going to may depend on these system variables. And the superposition does not hold, meaning that you cannot, if you have two inputs to a system, you cannot separate them and solve separately and then add them together. That is not true for a nonlinear system. Okay, this covers the introduction for this class. Uh, in the next video, we're going to start chapter one, which focuses on mechanical systems and equations.